No, we can eat it perfectly fine without it. start because I have to cover kind of a lot of stuff in the 20 minutes that I have because then we're going to get you guys on buses and go over to JSC. But um, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, this is a small group of you, so that means we can bring you into, into places that sometimes we don't always get a chance to bring the larger groups. So I think you guys are going to have a fun day. And for sure, when we do the crew uh, press conference, um, that's something that's brand new. We're trying that out. Um, on you guys, uh, so I think that'll be a really cool experience. Um, I'll give you a couple of hints on questions to ask Karen and Luca. I gave them their science briefing, oh, I guess like two weeks ago or something, so that means they won't remember anything anymore about it. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I talked to them, they said between them, they had one more brain cell left for, uh, for, to absorb anything that they were gonna get from training, so we'll see. Hopefully they remember something. So my name is Liz Warren. I'm from the International Space Station Program Science Office. And one of my jobs is to communicate the science that we're doing on the International Space Station in a way that is kind of digestible and interpretable and understandable to the public. It's not so easy to do on Twitter, <laughs> but I try. Um, so if you don't already follow ISS Research, please do so. and. Um, you know, hopefully share uh, some of the stuff that you're learning today with your followers. And I've even tried in my slides to use 140 characters where applicable. Um, <laughs> it's really hard. So I guess I'll just go ahead and get started. Some of this you're already going to know, but I'm going to reinforce it. Our space station is about as big as a football field. When I tell people outside of the NASA area about that, they're always amazed. They always ask, well, how did you launch something so big? <laughs> <laughs> and they, oh gosh, then you have to kind of back up and explain, well, this took a long time to build, uh, and uh, it was taken up piece by piece. And actually, one of the very coolest aspects of the International Space Station, it was built by people all over the world, and these components were brought together, for the most part, in space without ever having been tested on the ground. And I think it's a pretty incredible accomplishment that we never had to bring a big piece home because it didn't quite fit. So I think right there is one of our greatest um, engineering achievements as well as international achievement. Um, you know, we say it's about as big as a five bedroom house and being able to use all the volume inside makes it pretty spacious. With only three guys up there right now, I guarantee they could go their whole day uh, working without ever having run into their other crewmates, um, except of course at dinner or, or breakfast when they tend to gather uh, to talk about their day. There's a lot of facts on this slide and it's not really important that you absorb everything here. The point is uh, I want to try and show you the, the variety of disciplines of research that is occurring on the space station. Um, and also the breakdown of partners. So, you know, CSA has a number of experiments, ESA, uh, JAXA, and we have the majority. However, uh, Roscosmos and the Russian experiments are not so much included on this slide. It's one of the challenges of my office to integrate uh, a lot of information from all these international partners. And uh, it's actually really challenging to uh, to get all the right information in a timely manner. You'll notice that this slide is really only accurate through, uh, through January. So we're a couple of months behind on, on our metrics and tracking, um, but it's one of the responsibilities of the office to keep track of all this so that we can report what we're doing. Um, I guess the kind of highlight of this slide is that uh, 3536, look at 3536, um, we have at least 139 investigations that number is probably pretty solid, but it may change just slightly as we get things going. And as we like to say, that number isn't solid until the end of the increment because things always happen. Uh, if there has to be an emergency EVA or unplanned uh, vehicle traffic, an investigation may slide to the right, or basically in, in our lingo, that just means slide to a later increment. Is, uh, why do you break down the disciplines by different space agencies? That's fun. Um, just 
so you can get an idea. You can see everybody is, is doing technology research, but not uh, not everybody's doing human research in, in increment. JAXA, for example, maybe not so much, or if it's so little, it's not even uh, showing up there. Um, it, it's just to highlight the just, differences. Just to give you an idea of, of which agencies are doing what kind of research. I guess uh, the purple, or I'm sorry, the, the purple is human research. Uh, the blue, um, dark blue, everybody's doing education. Um, just to kind of give you a perspective of, of uh, the interest in what people are doing. Does each agency decide what they're going to do? Or is there like a that's a very good question. I think my next slide, nope, it doesn't. So <laughs> each agency um, is responsible for meeting their own science goals. Uh, they all include education, which is nice. But yeah, each agency just decides on where their priorities are. Um, and my office, the International Space Station Program Science Office, sets the overall priority. So if there's only five hours next week available to do science in a given slot, um, there's a prioritization for which experiment needs to happen at that point. Um, very often, human research wins out on priority because there's very distinct time points that we want to hit with the crew members. Flight day 15, flight day 30, those are really big because we're really interested in what's happening early on in the adaptation to space. Then usually there's a window, 60, flight day 60, 90, 120, and then when we get close to the end of the person's stay on orbit, there's also a lot of data collection. So some of those time points have very narrow uh, requirements windows. So in our lingo, we, we might say flight day seven plus or minus three, meaning we're okay collecting as early as flight day four or as late as flight day 10. So does that answer your question? Each, each agency pretty much chooses what they want to do, um, but the overall priority is, is set by, uh, by my office. That's very different for the Russian Space Agency and Roscosmos. It's all, we almost call it segmented ops. USOS is um, CSA, ESA, NASA, and JAXA, and then the Russian research, they're almost doing their, their, their own thing. You guys have heard that the International Space Station 2005 was de designated the National Laboratory by Congress. That means it is open to anyone and everyone to do research. That includes small businesses. It includes universities. It includes uh, big business. It includes anyone who wants to do research on the space station. And CASIS, the Center for the Advancement of Science and Space, their job is to manage the national lab. Their job is to make it easy for outside people, other government agencies, universities, to do research on the space station. This slide kind of just gives you an idea of NASA versus National Lab. If you have an experiment that you've come up with and it contributes to NASA's general goals of exploration, it's probably going to be funded by NASA and managed by NASA. If you have an experiment that is just, hey, I want to use microgravity to grow some crystals so I can make a better pharmacological agent. That's probably uh, going to fit under National Lab. Uh, it may be for profit for your company. Um, that's managed by cases. And <clears throat> this kind of shows you the type of research that occurs in each. So probably not so much human research in the National Lab arena, but biology and biotech, it's probably about 50-50 split between NASA and cases or National Lab. Does that sort of make sense? A lot of people are surprised. It's not just our 15 partners. 67 countries have participated in research uh, and utilization on the space station. Um, the flags around our program emblem, of course, are just the partner countries, but lots of other places uh, are, par are participating, maybe just in an educational way, but pretty impressive when you look at the list. I talked a little bit about the engineering achievement and how impressive it is to construct a football-sized laboratory in space. Uh, the international achievement I also sort of mentioned. It's really um, incredible to cooperate with uh, all these other nations, different cultures, different ideas, um, working together 
that's teaching us more than any government UN kind of collaboration I've ever heard of. Um, it's, it's really incredible to work with our partners and it, it makes us stronger as a nation, makes us stronger as a partnership and uh, it's gonna enable us to explore further. And then I'll spend the rest of my time talking about the research achievements, what we're actually benefiting science-wise. We like to categorize our science benefits in three general areas. Discovery, that's you know, either anticipated or unanticipated science um, discoveries that we're making. Benefits to Earth, those are experiments that are intended to make life better here on Earth or findings that do so. And enabling future experiments or future space exploration. There's a lot of experiments that uh, their intent is to learn more about how to operate in space. An example of that is an experiment called MISI. It's Materials on International Space Station Experiment. It's a platform. Oh, this is one of the ones that I built to be like a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a facility is put out. Uh, it's external. It's on the outside of the space station. A bunch of materials out there that are exposed to the thermal environment, the radiation environment, the atomic oxygen environment, um, everything outside. Micrometeorites. They test materials out there that may be used on future spacecraft. And there's a coating that was tested and validated on ISS that's actually on Mars Curiosity. So that's a real life example of something we learned on the space station and are applying it to future space exploration or current space exploration. There's an experiment called capillary flow experiment. It's a series of experiments. It's actually a, I think this one is Canadian, but I might be wrong about that. Um, basically studies how fluids move in space. It's pretty challenging. Um, if you have a big spherical tank of fuel, you know, it's not all gonna settle to the bottom. So how do you know how much is in there? Uh, there are temp there's gauges and ways to tell. Sometimes you use a little settling thruster, not on the space station, but um, and you, if you are designing a spacecraft, you want to know how much fuel is in there. Um, it's not so easy because the fuel kind of <coughs> tends to creep around, stick to the sides, and, and it is, you can use helium, of course, to pressurize. But um, if you don't want to do that, you can use a specially designed fuel tank. And we're learning uh, how, these, how these vessel shapes should be in order to um, move fluid or assess how much fluid you have in a tank. Um, we're also using this technology uh, of capillary flow to use or to make uh, more portable diagnostics for, for medical issues um, that don't even require power. So like a lab on a chip technology. Um, and if you, can, if you can make a medical diagnostic tool that uh, only needs just a little bit of blood, and I'm talking picoliters of blood, to assess disease, you can take this into you know, third world countries or places where access is not readily available to big laboratories. Um, so this is something that can really uh, benefit us on our um, A really big part of the space station research is studying the astronauts themselves how we keep them healthy, how we are able to keep people in space for six months, and they come back in pretty good shape and makes <coughs> us comfortable uh, with one year mission as well. You know, uh, we're going to, in 2015, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornieko are gonna live on space station for a whole year. What makes us comfortable doing those things is that we've learned quite a lot about how to keep people healthy in space. This was a really big paper that came out in uh, September of last year. This is a big, it's a number one bone journal. Um, it's the Journal of Bone and Mineral Research. Scott Smith from here at JSC published this paper and essentially uh, it <coughs> says that really intense exercise with ARED, um, which I think you guys are going to see later today, uh, along with adequate energy intake, it just means don't skimp on your food, eat all your meals. It's really tempting to just go look at the wind, go look out the window during lunch. Um, <laughs> no, please eat. Eat and uh, vitamin D supplementation um, really helps to prevent uh, loss of bone <coughs> mineral density. In fact, um, some people are even not just maintaining bone, but gaining a little bit of bone. Um, and also just aerobic fitness and strength. Uh, so that makes us happy. 
Microbial vaccine development. This is really hard to explain, um, but essentially you take some bacteria into space and they become more virulent, more pathogenetic. I was checking if I said that word right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we didn't ask here. Did you say it with confidence? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I learned in graduate school. Does it change in the microbes or in the way they infect people in space? It's a way, uh, it's not that the way they, they infect people in space, they just become a little bit nastier than they were in their little tube before launch. And then when you bring so, them back home, they're worse than before they left? No, they, they kind of return to normal. And what we think is happening is when these microbes, these bacteria are exposed to microgravity, they act more like they are in the human gut. So if I do a little experiment, I take some salmonella and I put it in a petri dish and I want to do experiments on it, eh, doesn't quite simulate what's going on in the human gut. And we think it has to do with shear. Shear is fluid motion across the surface. And believe it or not, that actually changes a lot of cellular activity, um, even as minimal shear. Convection results in shear. Convection is the driving of warmer fluid at the top and sinking down you know, as hot air rises, cold air sinks. Same thing happens in a, in a little petri dish of fluid. That doesn't happen in space. There's no convection because there's no density driven movement. So it's more close to what's going on in your gut. It's the best way I can explain this. And when salmonella bacteria are in your body, they're all cool until they get to your gut and then they just cause ravage, right? Same thing happens in space. So we're able to kind of study bacteria in a form that is more close to the gut when it's in microgravity. I hope that explains it a little bit. Essentially though, they found this controlling gene and are able to target it. And they're, we're working on a vaccine. I say we, they are working on a vaccine for salmonella and also for MRSA. MRSA is a really bad bacteria that lives in hospitals and kills a lot of people. It's resistant to most uh, antibiotics that we know of. The problem with research like this is that it takes years and years and years and years for it to actually reach human trials. So I tell you about this now, we're excited about it now, but it may be five, six, seven, ten years down the road before this is actually available. So it's part of the challenge of the International Space Station Science Office to say we're doing really good science. And then the taxpayers are saying, well, where is it? Well, you have to wait. <coughs> Another really cool thing about having a laboratory in space is the ability to look out the window and take amazing pictures. We have <laughs> instruments also that do this, but having a human um, being able to call up and say, hey, uh, there's, some, you know, there's a target that we want you to see um, and take photographs of. The lighting is going to be yada yada this way and that way. And um, it, we're able to actually use the International Space Station as part of the International Disaster Network. Um, it has not been used extensively as such, but it is part of an agreement, an international agreement, to uh, help take pictures of image disaster areas. This is a volcano, by the way, June of uh, 2009. And education, of course, is a really big part of NASA. It's a really good part of our, yeah. Oh, I don't know. Do you can. I, uh, I think uh, I have to okay. kind of hurry, but go ahead. No, no, no. All right. Well, don't don't forget it then. Um, so education, we we uh, try and reach a lot of students. This number is pretty impressive to me. Uh, Forty-three million students uh, and <coughs> almost three million teachers uh, from forty-nine countries. We're spreading the message. We're encouraging STEM education, inspiring the next generation. And uh, this is an experiment you can ask Luca about. Um, there's an Italian experiment called Ice GA, or Italian Combustion Experiment for Green Air. It's all about uh, combustion of um, biofuels, you know, plant byproducts. And we're studying how much soot or pollution it produces and how efficient we can make that fuel. If you can start the video clip, This is what combustion looks like in the sur rack. You light a little droplet of fuel, forms a beautiful sphere of fire, and then uh, 
In some cases, it doesn't extinguish. It just actually starts burning at a lower temperature. That's really cool for learning about fuels. If we can burn at lower temperatures and produce less soot and burn more efficiently, this little drop of fuel is burning much longer than expected. Um, that is applicable, of course, to our our life here on Earth. Combustion is a pretty big uh, product of, of our economy, and it's also a big impact on, on our environment. So um, we can learn a lot about combustion on the space station and make just even the teeniest improvement of efficiency of, of fuels. That uh, means a lot to our planet. So uh, ask, ask Luca about ICGA. This is, this is your crew for Expedition uh, 36, 5, 36, 37, sorry. Um, uh, Luca and Karen Nyberg and Fyodor Yuchikin. Um, they look pretty cool there. They just had their cake cutting ceremony. They're having a good time. They're ready to go. Um, of course, we have another launch in the meantime, but it's pretty exciting that you guys are going to be able to uh, ask them some questions at their press conference. When is their launch, Liz? May 28th, maybe. And my last slide is, you know, please connect with us. We're on Twitter. We've got a blog. It's not updated extremely frequently, but uh, gives kind of a more personal explanation of the science. And then our webpage, we also publish pretty frequently, at least once a week, a story that highlights one of our science experiments. We try and communicate it in a way that's easy to understand and uh, any results as well. We just published a really neat paper about um, a new plant study that was that was published uh, on Monday. We published a story on um, not on plants, I think actually. So <clears throat> we've got a lot out there. Um, so use our resources. And now I will answer your questions. I know we've got to actually hurry, I think. But go ahead. Um, I was just curious as to when they would call the ISS to take photos because I know like the Landsat satellites. And the other ones would pretty much do that 100% like, of the time and they cover as far as I know. So. Sure, the difference between uh, International Space Station um, you know, having a crew take a picture versus just using satellite imagery. It's a great question. Um, satellite imagery um, generally is always the same lighting conditions by design. They want the same lighting conditions for a lot of their pictures. Um, with the crew on board, you can actually take advantage of different light conditions because, uh, for example, if you want to catch, cap, capture something in a shadow or without a shadow, um, or <coughs> if, you, if you know the crew is just about to go over someplace, like that volcano, that was just, that was uh, serendipitous. Um, they just happened to be going over. But also, there's a lot of instruments on the outside of the space station that do imagery. Um, there's a hyperspectral ocean uh, tool that uses you know, wavelengths of light that you and I don't see, but it's able to measure es essentially uh, turbidity in the water, how clear water is in the coastal, coastal uh, areas. And that tells you a lot about um, temperature. It tells you about what kind of light can exist. Um, can tell you about algae blooms, you know, those kind of clog up waterways. So there's a lot of instruments that do more than just the human eye. And with the space station's orbit being in about 52 degree inclination, ends up covering, I, th I think it's about 95% of the planet, whereas uh, some of the satellites that orbit, um, they may be only in a, in a polar orbit uh, where they get the poles, but maybe not so much, uh, I don't know. Earth's turning, so they cover a lot of the, of the Earth as well. But there, there's definitely an advantage of to being able to call up. We don't want to wake the crew up in the middle of the night to do something like that, but um, in, in dire cases, we would. Any other questions? No other questions? Well, I do. Okay. I was not wanting to butt in, but um, since no one else is asking, I love what you said about research on the ISS and how that affects us here on Earth and the, um, the, the fact that it takes so long for it to come to the public. Is there no way for us to kind of speed that up? I mean, look what you're doing on the ISS. Doesn't that like say something about the research that we can't say, look what we're doing, therefore we know more, so let's turn this over and get it going in the process, and can't we shave like three years off? <laughs> Not with human uh, research. 
Um, with a lot of other things in materials research and the combustion stuff, those results are, are available pretty quick. But um, a lot of people connect more with say, you know, hey, if you're solving bone loss in astronauts, how come we haven't solved os osteoporosis here on the ground? So I guess the really the long pole there is, is really only in human research. Um, and some of, some of our, I think, in my opinion, kind of, I'm a physiologist, some of our most exciting findings have to do with physiology. Um, but no, you can't, you can't just speed up that process. It takes, it takes some time and, and uh, science takes time. You know, it's, it's just, it's not just the space station. People working just in a lab here on Earth, it takes, it takes I know a friend of mine, dear friend of mine is, is working in pancreatic cancer and she has something really good. She's got something really good that will change lives, but not right now. It takes a while. So it's just a, it's just a fact of science. It takes some time. So the good thing is, is Liz is gonna go with us and we are going to building five. So yay. <laughs> um, and so you'll have an opportunity to ask her some more questions directly related to things that she's just talked to about or anything new that we learned while we're inside the simulator. So, um, okay. Do you guys know what this podium is? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 If you don't, this is the podium that John F. Kennedy spoke using it at Rice University when he said, you know, we're going to go to the moon. I saw that. I think it's probably that podium in the library at Rice several months ago. Did this move around, or is there another one like it? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, it might have because they were celebrating their hundredth anniversary. Yeah. Okay. We were doing that time. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.